Have you ever had big plans for a Christmas experience? You know, you thought it all out, you had it all laid out in your mind, and then when it actually took place, everything kind of fell apart. You ever had that happen? Something got burned, or somebody didn't show up, or somebody extra showed up, and they brought somebody you weren't expecting that kind of turned the whole thing on its head. Anybody ever have something like that happen? Just it blew it up. Best laid plans, right? I remember, I may have told this story years ago, but uh, we have five kids, but when our first kid was born, Caleb, you know, when you're, you, 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 you plan in your mind how every Christmas is going to go, and then your first kid shows up, and you want everything to be in a certain way. You want it to be just right. You want to get the pictures just right and the experience. You, you, they're, you know, not even one years old, but you want them to remember this moment and feel what you felt when you were a kid. And so we had it all planned out. Well, then a day or so before Christmas, Caleb got sick with RSV. And so all the Christmas plans we had of traveling here and showing off the baby, traveling here with the leaves and the, the deal and, the, and dressing him up in the real cute Christmassy clothes and showing him off here and there and passing him off so everybody can see well, how proud we are. And yeah, all that went out the window because then we couldn't leave the house because uh, we didn't want, you know, he was sick and wasn't doing well. So what ended up happening is uh, traveling to grandparents and other grandparents and other grandparents and seeing family, all that was gone. And so if anybody wanted to see us, they had to come to our house. And it turned out to be the most relaxing Christmas we have ever had, before or since. <laughs> um, uh, if we had these best laid plans and it all worked out in our mind, but then it all went to pot, or so we thought, and it ended up being the best thing ever uh, on the back end. What we're going to see today in, in Luke chapter 2, where we're going to be, the Christmas story is we might anticipate best laid plans, but God's plan is always better than what we ever thought possible. You see, here you have Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph, angels came to each of them. An angel came to each of them and said, the Son of God is coming, and you are going to raise him. Try to put yourselves in their shoes for a second. If that responsibility was laid on you, would there be any anxiety in your heart whatsoever? Son of God, right? I mean, the one who's been prophesied since the beginning of the world. I am going to raise the Son of God. I want to get everything right. The birth is going to be just so. We're going to have this. I mean, Joseph's a carpenter. I imagine Joseph is thinking through, okay, Son of God, well, I'm going to have this kind of crib, and it's going to be looking like this, and I'm going to decorate it like this thing in the Old Testament, and I'm going to do this and that and the other thing, and everything's going to be amazing. And then the government comes along and issues a decree it kind of messes up their plan. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. Now this registration, this was a census for taxes. Rome wanted to make sure all their, they got all their tax money. And the way Rome worked back in the first century, they didn't really care how people did the census. They didn't really care even how people collected taxes as long as they got their money. They said to East Little Region, you count the people however you want to count the people as long as you count the highest number possible and collect the highest amount possible and send it to us. Just do that. And so everybody counted people differently. Well, in this particular part of the world, the way they counted people is they said, you have to go back to your ancestral home where your ancestors are from and register there, be counted in that city. Well, Joseph, who we saw when the angel came to him, he went ahead and married Mary right away. Uh, he was of the line of the great King David. And King David came from the city of Bethlehem. And so Joseph had to go to Bethlehem, taking his pregnant wife, Mary, along with him. And so all the plans they had thought up, maybe they had looked it up, maybe they knew the Son of God was going to be born in Bethlehem. They hadn't quite figured out how to get there and all that process yet. Uh, but they had to travel to Bethlehem, and Mary's on the verge of giving birth. All right, so keep all this in mind. And so everything they had already been planning for the birth of the Son of God had to be put on hold for a minute while they traveled to Bethlehem to be registered, not knowing how long it's going to take. 
not knowing how long the census was going to take. You may think the government takes a long time now. Try to put that in the first century terms, all right? They were going to have to go and be registered and, and the census taken and the whole process. No idea how long it was going to take. And so they traveled down there from Nazareth down to Bethlehem to sign up for the census. Uh, verse 4. And Joseph also went up from Galilee down or from the town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Now, I, I love that verse, verse 6. It's obvious that this was written by a man. Uh, has anybody in the room ever given birth? Would you say that is a very subdued way to phrase it? <laughs> And the time came for her to give birth. Uh, I doubt it was that peaceful uh, at all, uh, but that's the way Luke writes it, and Joseph is there, and Mary is there, and they show up in Bethlehem, and, and it's baby time, and uh, they don't have a place to stay. Look at verse 7. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, we don't know a whole lot about first century inns. Um, we do know a little bit. More often than not, first century inns were almost like B&Bs, like um, rooms in people's houses that they rented out. And uh, some of the bigger houses, you know, it's, it's had stables built into their houses. Either their house was kind of in a semicircle with uh, a courtyard in the middle, that's where they kept all the animals, or houses were two stories, and the bottom story was like the the stable where they kept all the animals. Others had like a communal stable, like in a cave just outside of town. Some people kept animals just in the city square. Um, so wherever this situation is, we know that there's a manger. We, we can surmise that there's other animals there. And so all that they had planned about the arrival of the Son of God, now they're giving birth around a bunch of animals and Joseph, the, the skilled carpenter, is laying the Son of God in a manger, a roughly hewn feed box built by somebody else, in among animal slobber, unless they were able to clean out the hay. This was not at all what they pictured, not at all how they planned it. They didn't have a place to stay. They're putting him in a borrowed manger, and here they are, this couple from Nazareth, down in Bethlehem, and nothing is like it was supposed to be, at least in their imagining. But look at what happened that same night. Verse 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. Now, I love this imagery here in verse 9, right? The, the shepherds are out in the field just doing the regular shepherd stuff, and it says there that the angel of the Lord appeared to them. You know, we often have the image of, a, of an angel in the sky, but that's not in the verse. The, the idea is an angel just appears right next to them, and it says the glory of the Lord shone around them. So as much as it would be scary that an angel suddenly appears next to them, I really believe that the fear that they experienced there at the end of the verse comes from the glory of the Lord. I mean, think the brightest light you've ever seen in your entire life and the physical presence of God in the light not only exploding in your eyeballs, but almost like it's moving through your body kind of a situation. So all of a sudden it's night, it's dark, boom, bright light, and they're feeling the presence of the Lord with, with an intensity most of us have never experienced before. And so this great fear comes on them, like, I don't know what this is, I don't know what's happening, what in the world is this? Uh, look at verse 10. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened 
which the Lord has made known to us. So they're experiencing all this, the angel appearing, the glory of the Lord. They're experiencing the angel say, you know, don't be afraid. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. There, there was probably other babies in Bethlehem, probably other babies wrapped in swaddling cloths. But most likely there's only one baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And so the shepherds are, are contemplating everything they've just experienced and heard, and they say to one another, we've got to go see what this deal is. I mean, an angel shows up and appears to us of all people. I mean, shepherds were thought of as a lower class citizen. And here angels show up to them and tell them the son of God is here. And they say, they're coming to us and they're telling us this. We've got to go and find him. So they leave their sheep and they head into town. Verse 16. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. So they ran into town, Bethlehem. They they searching, maybe they're looking in windows of houses trying to find a baby. They found a baby, no manger, it's not this one, looking in this house. Oh, I found a baby, not in swaddling clothes, so it's not this one. And they finally find the right one. They run up in there. And they, they explained to Mary and Joseph everything that they experienced. They just saw with the angel. Mary and Joseph said, yeah, we know those angels. They, they will come to you and they will surprise you. And the shepherds hang out there for a little bit. Verse 18. But it would appear that Mary and Joseph weren't the only ones listening. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. So the idea of that verse is that there were some other people there listening in to the conversation whether they were also staying in the, in the stable area because there was no other room, maybe so, maybe they were just walking the street, you know, and, and they saw these shepherds running through town and they wanted to see what was going on. Maybe people were helping Mary have the baby. We don't really know, but we do know there were other people there. All who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. Verse 19, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Now we believe that that verse is there because Luke, who wrote this account, got this information from Mary, that he was interviewing her later on in life. And Luke is making a note. Mary remembered all of this. That's why I have this information. Verse 20, and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So quite an experience the shepherds had just had this Christmas night nearly 2,000 years ago. But I want you to jump back up to verse 16, how they found the baby, right? The baby was lying in a what? A manger. A manger. The very thing that may have been a disappointment to Mary and Joseph, having to place the Son of God in a manger. It would seem that that very thing that may have been a disappointment was a part of the plan the whole time. The thing that may have been a disappointment was the thing that God used to to reveal the Son of God to the first people he told about it, these shepherds. The thing that may have been a disappointment was the recognizing element to the whole thing. Yeah, babies were in Bethlehem, no doubt. Yeah, babies were wrapped in swaddling cloths, for sure. But I guarantee you, he was the only one in a manger. And that is what made him recognizable to these shepherds, was the manger part of it they showed up and he was in a manger you know sometimes what feels like a disappointing part of our own personal stories may actually be purposefully planned by God to be a powerful chapter in what God is doing in our story what was undoubtedly a disappointment to them the manger placing the son of God in a manger it showed the shepherds Jesus Jesus was revealed to the world by a disappointment in the life of Mary and Joseph. That source of disappointment was used by God as a proof for who Jesus was. It proved to the shepherds that's who Jesus was. But let me ask you this question. If, in fact, Mary and Joseph were even, I mean, in the moment, maybe they were overwhelmed with the presence of Jesus after he arrived. Undoubtedly, they were. Uh, But however you shake it out, the situation did not turn out like what they would have anticipated. But what if Mary and Joseph there in the stable area had been consumed with 
being focused on that disappointment. Have you ever had disappointment just overwhelm your mind and you can't think about anything else? Disappointment in life, disappointment with the situation, disappointment in a person, disappointment with how stuff just played out. And it just kept rolling around in your head. You just thought about it when you went to bed. You thought about it when you got up. You thought about it throughout the day. And you just can't get it out of your mind. What if Mary and Joseph there sitting in that area just continued to see the negative? That sheep that's, ba- you know, that's bleeding, or that's just irritating the fire out of me. I cannot believe, Joseph, you did not get a room in the inn. I cannot believe that we got to put the Son of God in a manger for Pete's sake. What if they were consumed with that when the shepherds showed up? And that's all they're doing is bickering and fighting and irritated at the circumstance. You think the shepherds are going to walk into that and worship and praise? No. But they weren't focused on that. Even though sometimes that tends to be how we think. Or maybe not you. Maybe you're all holy. and That's sometimes the way I think. Isn't it better, though, to focus on who was with them? Even though the things weren't as they envisioned. Even though the things weren't as they had planned. They were focused on Jesus and just the actual experience that the Son of God was here. You know, we may find ourselves at times in our lives disappointed. Even at Christmas time right now, you may find yourself disappointed right now. That this is not playing out like what you thought. Back in June, maybe a year ago, you thought this year would be different. And it's not quite how you anticipated it. We may find ourselves, even in the middle of the destruction of the best laid plans, we can ask ourselves then, how did this happen? Why did this happen? Why did they do that? Why did they say that? How did it come to this? If only this one thing had gone right, if only this one thing had been said, if only this one thing had not been said, if only this, this, this one thing had not taken place the way it did. But maybe when those disappointing, disappointing circumstances arise, maybe a better question would be, I can't wait to see what Jesus does with this. I can't wait to see what Jesus does with this. Because I know in Romans 8, all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. However that may be, that may not be till eternity, I don't know yet, but I know that promise is in the scripture, and so I can't wait to see what God does with this one. I mean, this one's just garbage. I can't wait to see how he's going to make, you know, a miracle out of this mess. This is going to be something incredible. I just can't wait to see it. I mean, Mary and Joseph putting the Son of God in a manger, of all things, was the thing that the angel told the shepherds. He's in a manger. That's how you're going to know who he is. Maybe the thing that is such a disappointment in your life, maybe the thing that's such a disappointment right now is the very thing God's going to use as a tit pole for something in the future to call back on and say, look what I did with that. Look what I did with that. You see, here's the deal. I've been, I've been, since the Lord gave me this sentence, I've been quoting it to myself all week long. Even on the way to church this morning, uh, my mind got the better of me and the Lord quoted this back to me. You see, here's the deal. Everything is redeemable when the Redeemer is with you. Everything. Everything is redeemable when the Redeemer is with you. The situation, the circumstance, the relationship, the frustration, it's redeemable when the Redeemer is with you. And you know what that word redeem means? Then we throw that around in church all the time. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed to the Lord say so. Redeemed. The, the, the basic idea in the original language is to purchase, uh, to, to purchase from something bad for something great. To purchase from something bad, like slavery or death, and purchase it for something great, like freedom and life. That's the idea of redeemed. To be purchased from something bad for something great. Every situation, every circumstance is redeemable when the Redeemer is with you. You may not be able to see it now. Honestly, you may never see it in this life. I mean, just read the book of Job. You get to the end of Job, Job 42, and you find out he is never told why he experienced all that mess. Not once is he told that we know of. 
But how, did the, how was his story redeemed? I mean, he, he says it. How, how is his story redeemed? As a message to us, passed down and told and instilled in our hearts. You may not see how your story is redeemed. You may not see it, but people are watching you. People are watching how you react. Maybe it's little people in your house. Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's somebody who's sitting across from you in this room right now. Somebody's watching you. Your story can be redeemed in how you react to what you experience. Because a believer is supposed to react differently from anybody else. Because a a believer has Jesus. A believer has the Redeemer. Everything can be redeemed when the Redeemer is with you. And so you have to ask yourself then, what has been your disappointment lately? Who has been a disappointment lately? Or maybe, have you ever felt like a disappointment? Maybe somebody has spoken those words to you and it cut you deep. And you feel it every time they look at you with those eyes like, and you can't shake it. But the thing is, Everything can be redeemed. Everything. You're not beyond redemption. You're not. Wherever you find yourself, whatever decision you made yesterday, two weeks ago, two years ago, you're not beyond redemption. You're still here. He still has a purpose for you this Christmas. To be redeemed, to to spread his redemption. And so the question then is, I can't wait to see what Jesus does with this. How can Jesus redeem your situation? Just have faith that he will and see what he does. Maybe today you need to be redeemed. Maybe you've never believed in Jesus before. You've known about Christmas. You watch Charlie Brown. You see Linus say his deal at the end. And and even, I mean, I read that passage and that's how I hear it. I hear it in Linus's voice. Um, But you've never actually believed. Well, then today's your opportunity to believe in Jesus that Jesus is God's son, that he came to this earth and he died so all your sins would be forgiven. And then he rose from the dead so you can live after you die. And that's it. You believe in that, you gain access to heaven. Jesus tells us in John 17, 3, that in that moment you believe, you get eternal life. Eternal life doesn't start when you die, it starts when you believe. And so if you have a belief in Jesus, you have eternal life and life is different. Different for you. And so will you believe today? Whether you're in the room or you're watching online, believe in Jesus here and now and experience this Christmas like it has never been before in your life. Here is your moment. Believe in Jesus. And so as we sing these carols in just a few minutes, if you believe in Jesus, you'll be singing them with a different meaning behind them. But for all of us, whatever your circumstance or situation may be, what is it that you have in your life right now that needs to be redeemed? Maybe you need to walk into a family conversation tonight or tomorrow with a different spirit, with an understanding that the Lord can redeem that situation, that person, that conversation. Everything is redeemable when the Redeemer is with you.